Hello. So, it's time for Folklore 101, Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. And this time we're going to be talking about how folklore develops, changes, grows, and how that inevitably leads to variation. <laughs> So last time we talked about how anything that is primarily passed down through oral tradition is by definition folklore. And the thing about that, the thing about passing things down through oral tradition is that while the core characteristics of the tradition usually remain stable and usually stay the same, the minor details, the minor characteristics are very 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 susceptible to change and will vary a great deal and sometimes when minor characteristics change if there's enough change in the minor characteristics that can kind of give a change to the overall tone of a piece of folklore to the to the themes of it now occasionally over enough time it is possible for um the core characteristics to change as well, but that's a lot more rare. The main engine in change in folklore is iteration. Uh, this is most easily seen in things like um, folk tales and folk songs, but we can see it in stuff like vernacular architecture, which is where um, uh, building traditions are passed down orally. Uh, we can see it in aspects of material culture, uh, just handcrafts, that kind of thing. Uh, but it is most easily seen in folk songs and folk tales. So I'll be focusing on folk tales. Just understand this can apply to other aspects as well. So when you're passing down a piece of folklore, you have to understand that the people you're passing it down to are also going to pass it down in turn. And what they will be passing down won't necessarily be your understanding. It will be their understanding of your understanding. So that is the first way in which change enters in through iteration. It is an understanding of an understanding of an understanding. Uh, it is very much interpretive. What people pass down depends on how they interpreted it. The second way in which iteration changes folklore is kind of communication style. Um, if you have a tendency to tell stories in a very basic way, for example, not including minor details that you see as inconvenient or unnecessary. So we'll use leprechauns as a good example because they're very easy. Uh, the core characteristics of leprechauns are that they're short, that they're um, associated with gold and that they make shoes. Those are the core characteristics. Let's say you tell a story about leprechauns and you mention that the leprechaun's short and you mention the leprechaun makes shoes, you le mention that it's associated with gold, but you don't say like how short the leprechaun is. You just say it's small and then a person who heard the story from you, their understanding is that the leprechaun is very small. That's the image they got in their head. So they might describe the leprechaun as only being a few inches tall. But a second person you told the story to, because you didn't specify, their understanding was that the leprechaun was just like a small person. So they described the leprechaun as being about three feet tall. And then a third person, you didn't describe what the leprechaun was wearing. So they decide they're going to describe it when they continue on. And that's another way for a uh, variation to inject itself into how folklore is passed down. The, the first part was people just passing down their understanding, their interpretation. And the second part is people filling in details that you chose to leave out. Uh, the reverse of that can happen as well. Sometimes people will find that a piece of information is too, um, has too much information, that there's too much exposition, there's, there's too much detail, and will leave parts out. 
and then that leaves the opportunity for the next people to come on in and fill in those details again but they'll do it differently this time which is how um, throughout Ireland leprechauns are in fact described as being a range of different heights from a couple of inches to up to about three foot tall leprechauns are described as wearing green brown red and even occasionally yellow or blue jackets uh, which is largely a regional thing um, there they are usually associated with gold but that association tends to to vary uh, sometimes they own the gold sometimes they're just protecting the gold sometimes they just know where the gold happens to be and don't really have anything to do with it themselves and that is minor characteristics changing while the core characteristics remain the same even though some of those changes like whether or not the leprechaun owns the gold itself even though that's a change in a minor characteristic it still very much alters the theme of the story because it could take the story from your robbing from the leprechaun and change it to you are um, grave robbing or you are stealing something that you are causing the leprechaun to fail in its duties by stealing the gold. Uh, that's, those, are, those are very, very different kinds of themes, different kinds of um, ideas that are both being told with the same story with the same core characteristics. And of course, when you tell a story to say five different people each of those five people is going to have their own kind of inter interpretation their own understanding of it so when they tell when those five people communicate that story out again they are going to communicate their own understandings of it not your one and then say each of those five people uh, communicates it to another set of five people the same thing will happen again and again and again and again forever and that is why we have variation in folklore it is a natural expected process and it's why uh folklorists we have all of these different vastly complicated uh categorization systems for tail types and subtypes we've roughly a dozen different uh types of the Cinderella story for example that we look out for and each um, telling of even within those types will be slightly different and have slightly different characteristics. Now aside from iteration the second major force in the change growth and development of folklore is localization. So say you have someone just for the sake of argument Someone from Ireland has gone off and lived in Africa for a while and they've heard a bunch of African stories say we'll say we'll be specific we'll say Ga Ghanaian stories they went to Ghana they heard a bunch of Ghanaian stories they came back to Ireland and they want to tell those stories but they don't want to have to explain um, give the history of this building in Ghana before they can tell their story in a way, way that makes sense to those people so they will change the story so it's about a place nearby in Ireland that has a similar kind of history so that the context is kind of similar but that they don't have to give all of this uh, context they don't have to give all of this exposition just so the story will be able to make sense or they might not change the setting but say if there's a certain musical instrument or a certain um, uh, piece of clothing that is used in that Ghanaian story but is not present in Ireland they will substitute in uh, a different item of clothing a different uh, musical instrument just so it'll make sense for the people listening and that kind of thing happens in every fucking direction um, that kind of thing can happen from Irish people telling Ghanaian stories for, to, for, to Ghanaian people telling Irish stories. This has been happening back and forth across hundreds of different cultures for thousands of years. And that is how, that is another 
major um, influence point for uh, change, for variation in folklore. Uh, the third major element in the change and growth and development of folklore is immigration. Say you have a community of people from one culture move and settle among uh, the people of another culture in another country. Uh, they will bring with them their folklore. And um, I don't just mean folk tales and folk songs. They will bring their vernacular architecture. They will bring their uh, material culture as well. And elements of that culture that these people have brought with them will begin to spread out amongst the people they have moved in with. Among the, amongst the people of the culture they have whose land they are now living in and they will begin to be incorporated into that folklore and I don't just mean stuff like folk tales and folk songs I mean stuff like material culture stuff like vernacular architecture like styles of building a house if people like these styles that have been brought in from another culture they are going to copy them and that is going to have to lead to a change in material fashions if this culture brings in useful tools useful handcrafts that didn't exist in the country they've moved to before the people of that culture the 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 culture that already existed there will start to adopt them as well very likely especially if they're particularly useful and they will start getting used in different contexts and in different ways and that is a normal function one good example of this and again i'm folk tales are the easiest example especially for a professional storyteller so i'll be going into that is the figure of down which is something i've talked about before uh, down dates back hundreds of years but because he's primarily a monster figure and because monster had a huge amount of uh, Viking settlement down began taking on characteristics associated with the Norse god Odin like there's a very old story where Odin goes to a blacksmith pulls off one of the legs of his horse and asks the blacksmith to reshoe the leg. The blacksmith just does as he's told, takes the shoe off the leg, puts on a new one, then gives the leg back to Odin, and Odin just reattaches it to the horse. And that story is also told about Down, and that is likely because of the influence of Norse settlers within Munster. That kind of thing happens all the time. It brings new characteristics to folkloric figures, it brings new characters even sometimes for the established folkloric characters to interact with and it is a natural normal um, part of folklore it is a natural normal part of how folklore develops and I just because I know some people are going to go well what why are people complaining about cultural appropriation if this is all so normal and no, the, the, that's not appropriation, that is exchange, that is influence. Appropriation is when you actively stop people from practicing their own culture and then you go and practice it yourself. It's a different fucking thing. If you were just, if it was just assimilating, not even assimilating, if it was just taking on some of their culture, uh, um, aspects some of their cultural practices incorporating them into your own and just leaving it at that and letting them continue practicing their own as well no one would be complaining it wouldn't be a problem shut the fuck up that's not the same thing another thing that has a strong influence on folklore the and a lot of people are going to be mad about this one is propaganda a lot of aspects of folklore are deliberately introduced as propaganda. They are intru deliberately introduced to change people's perceptions of certain groups. Uh, if you watched my changeling video, we, that's an example. 
Chain the Changeling Child began as essentially church propaganda against and I was focusing on disability in that video so yes against the disabled but also also it has been used by the church um, for anti-black and anti-semitic propaganda as well um, one of the German words for a changeling is also was also a slur used against Jewish people and many of the church's earliest descriptions of changelings which were demonic uh, in the early church stuff not fairies fairies was kind of like actually that's a good example of localization um, uh, as the church spread the uh, the idea of changelings um, they became localized in different European contexts as fairies rather than as demons but anyway, the early church depictions of changeling, of changeling children um, talked about their black skin uh, a lot of the time. Uh, you can go to my changeling video and look at the script in the description. It has all of my sources there. What you're really looking for is Dr. Rose Alice Sawyer's uh, thesis on changelings. So yes, sometimes people deliberately introduce folklore or alter folklore to engineer hate uh, or to actually quite the opposite to to um, make people like certain people more to make people uh, praise certain individuals more uh, one interesting thing is uh, you see a lot of people these days railing against the idea that um, superheroes in comic books are like modern mythology that they are the um, successors to uh, the myths of ancient Greece or Rome that kind of thing which is extremely Eurocentric and extremely Western Eurocentric but let's let's <laughs> let's not get ahead of ourselves um, and they they say that People say that that's nonsense because uh, so many comic books and superheroes are deliberately written as propaganda, but most of those myths, when they were being written down, were being written to be propaganda. They were being written to glorify um, Rome or to glorify certain emperors or to glorify certain uh, dynasties that were connected to some of those mythological figures. This has always been a thing, and it always will be a thing. Um, so, no, yeah, it makes total sense to say that they're successors. Another major influence in variation of folklore is isolation. So when, when a community is isolated from other members of their culture, that means their folklore, their folk traditions, are going to develop along very different lines because they don't have the other members of their culture influencing them. So you can end up with... Because they start with the same core characteristics, you can definitely see echoes of each other across them, but they can end up in very different directions. A good example of this is Ireland itself. Um, Irish folklore and mythology ha does have a lot in common with the mythology and folklore of other Celtic nations. However, the other Celtic nations tend to have more in common in terms of folklore and mythology with each other than they do with Ireland. And that is largely because Ireland is all the way off on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, all by itself on an island. It was the least accessible by the others and had the least access to the others. And so it developed along different lines as a result. Another good example of this, actually a very good individual example, is um, Irish Americans and eating corned beef and cabbage. Now, in Ireland for a long time there was a tradition of eating bacon and cabbage. And this was because cabbage is easy to grow and pigs are easy to keep, they're easy to raise, and uh, salted meat lasts longer, you can store it for longer. And everyone was poor! Um, now, when Irish people had to leave for America during the famine, they were settling primarily in areas like New York and Boston, and they were primarily settling in 
predominantly Jewish areas. And because of that, they were having to get most of their meat from kosher butchers, which meant they couldn't get bacon. Um, it, just, it just wasn't something they could procure. So they got corned beef instead, which is just another salted meat. And that's been going on for so long. That has been the case for so long that Irish Americans eat corned beef with cabbage that they have forgotten why it's happened, why, why that is its own thing, and that it was ever not that way at all, and that it's actually different in Ireland and always had been. So that's an example of isolation causing change, but it's also a really good example of localization. Isolation is the reason they've forgotten any change happened at all, and localization is the reason that the change had to happen in the first place. It's a very, it's actually a very good, solid, individual example of how this changes. I'm gonna have to remember it for future. I was, future. I was originally planning to talk about how the internet influences all of this and how the internet requires us to open up our definitions of folklore slightly in this episode but I think it's dragging on a little bit already, so I'm going to tackle that in episode three. Revenge of the Sith. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned something, and uh, come join me next time.